And, and so let me go ahead and introduce Dan. Uh, Dan Isaac is a research fisheries scientist at the Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station. And many of you may know Dan. His research interests are, are numerous, and his uh, publications are numerous on the topics of climate change and stream habitats and fish communities, stream temperature mon monitoring and modeling, uh, variation in the distribution and abundance of stream fishes relative to environmental gradients and disturbance, and a number of other issues as well, including digital and social media to connect people, information, and landscapes. So Dan, uh, I want to welcome you and thank you in advance for your time today. And it looks like your slide is up, so we got the technology to work just in time. Great. Thank, thank you, David, for, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to visit a little bit um, about kind of where things are, are headed um, with, with some of the work that we're doing um, in, in coordination with a lot of people across the region. Uh, I'll, I'll talk some today about um, the, the regional stream temperature Northwest project to kind of give an update of what's going on there. But um, when David and I were talking about um, doing this, it, it occurred to me that there, there might be a broader thing here that, that's actually occurring within which, um, you know, we, we could tell a more, tell a more interesting story or a, new, a novel aspect to, to what we, what's been going on with regards to stream temperatures. Um, across the Northwest, and, and that to me is really kind of the emergence of you know what what I like to call a stream internet, which, because there's there's this capacity now to build accurate digital information uh, from hundreds of users uh, and be able to transpose that information through space and in some regards through time as we do different climate change scenarios. That you know, doing that for stream temperature is. is one example of that, but we can also do that for, for a lot of the other resources that we're interested in managing and conserving on um, streams, whether that be different um, aquatic organisms or other different uh, water quality attributes. And so, so that's kind of the more general story I want to try to convey today. And so before I really get into um, the details there, I wanted to also acknowledge some of the people that have been um, really core collaborators and, and um, forming the, the components that, that help do these sorts of uh, larger scale projects. Um, and, and here in the Boise Aquatic Sciences Lab, we're, we're really blessed with having just absolutely superb professional support staff. And so um, I want to mention Dave Nagel's name, who, who's our GIS guru, runs our GIS shop that, that makes sure all the uh, spatial data that we're creating you know, is up to snuff. It's got good metadata associated with it. it. It's basically professional quality stuff by the time it leaves our lab so that people can use it and, and also understand you know where, where things are coming from in terms of the information that we're providing. Um, Donna Haran, Sharon Parks, she's our she's our web design person. So as we you know want to build and convey this information out more broadly, um, you know, she helps us design um, web pages on the fly. Gwen Chandler's our, our database person and Sherry Woolrab is kind of our jack of all trades. Uh, two other people that are really important here are Aaron Peterson and Jay Verhoof. And so they've been um, collaborating with us now for seven or eight years, um, going back to some of the original stream temperature models that, that we built using some of their um, statistical techniques for stream networks. And, and they've basically been collaborating together as a duo now for almost a decade. And they've um, developed a new class of spatial statistical models for stream networks. And these um, we'll go through examples of, of kind of why those are better than some of the traditional statistical techniques that we've had to apply to streams. Um, another really important um, component of this then are the hundreds of biologists and hydrologists that a lot of times we're um, working with in terms of um, using some of the data sets that, that folks are collecting out there in the field. Um, you know, and without that data to feed into building these sorts of regional scale models, and, and having then uh, people willing to use that information to make decisions on the ground, you know, none, none of this would go anywhere. And so, so uh, I very much view um, folks in the field and, and biologists of all stripes from, um, you know, not just Forest Service, but all agencies across the region as, as part of this thing um, that, that's starting to happen now in terms of building better spatial data sets and, and information. So, and, and the idea then behind, you know, a stream internet, if we, if we want to call it that, is that we're going to need better information to make more efficient decisions um, going forward. If we're going to be effective at, at doing um, what we're charged with doing um, in terms of better managing and conserving aquatic resources, you know, and this is obviously epitomized by the sorts of decisions we may have to make um, this century with regards to climate change and how it might affect um, the distribution of different species, 
um, you know, where are we going to invest, and, and is the science going to be strong enough that it can support making some of the tough decisions um, that we're going to have to do um, down the line here. But there's also a suite of other things um, going on that, that just are always going to be putting an increasing amount of pressure on you know, a limited resource base that's out there. And unfortunately, in, in this climate, certainly you know, budgets are flat or shrinking, and so there's always going to be the need to do more with less. And so um, that, I think, is going to be one of the key ways to potentially make it through this bottleneck that, that we're facing um, in terms of um, you know, needing to make more efficient decisions. And so one of the things that human society has invented the last couple of decades is, is the Internet, right? So, so this is just an interlinked system, basically, of um, generating massive amounts of information and then efficiently transposing that information simultaneously to, to lots of different uh, potential users of that information. So you know, there's all the peripherals that we're familiar with in terms of how we access the Internet, but there's also um, ways that it's collecting data and, and learning, right? And so you know, when we go online and we surf and we're clicking on things to show and talk about our preferences, you know, it, it's storing that information. It's learning about us as the system is evolving. All that goes into, you know, Google servers. Um, you know, Apple has their iCloud, and, and all this information is, is stored and warehoused in databases. And then, you know, obviously with the big budgets that the tech companies have, they've got literally hundreds of postdocs and, and, and uh, other people with computer science degrees that are, you know, playing with these big data sets, flying search algorithms to find the signal in, in the noise and that all feeds together into a big network system. And, and I think you know, we're kind of at that point, you know, at a much smaller scale and obviously a lot smaller budget um, that we can start to think about direct analogs for how that might play out um, with regards to aquatic resources. And so, you know, our new data in, in terms of how the system is, is learning and feeding into um, an Internet it is the sensor networks that, that are increasingly being put out there for temperature, for flow, um, lots of biological monitoring going on people working on landscapes, right? And so they have an intuitive feel for um, the status of resources on those landscapes. And so that's where this, this system is gaining new information. Our Google servers, you know, that's our, our institutional memory and the corporate databases um, that, that the various agencies have. You know, in the Forest Service, we work with something called the National um, uh, or Resource Monitor uh, or management system, and so NRM, and we've got within that aquatic surveys module, which is where a lot of our temperature data and other um, things about aquatic resources are stored. Other institutions have that sort of thing. USGS has their um, NWIS, National Water Information System, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where you know this data, this information about resource status is being archived in some way, shape, or form. And then in terms of you know teasing out the signal from the noise and thinking about generating new information, then we've got you know the research branch within various agencies, and then there's new types of analyses now that are coming online um, for um, those stream data sets that that allow us to extract useful information about these things. And then once that's created, then you know it, it can be put out there pretty quickly, and, and people can have broad access to it. And so. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the parallels potentially with, with regards to the real Internet. So, so there's several key ingredients then that, that um, go into this and that have kind of been evolving of their own accord over the last four or five years that now can kind of come together and we can start to get synergies between these things. Um, one of these um, ingredients then is just having better geospatial tools and, and accurate um, regional and national um, foundational data sets for streams. And so you know, there's a lot of remote sensing information out there that we can describe the terrestrial environment and link that to watershed boundaries or streamlines um, and use that then to create some uh, covariates that allow us to predict better the attributes of streams. Things like the, the um, USGS NHD plus hydrography layer, well, when that came out, that, that to me was a huge thing because now we've got a nationally consistent um, database that already has a suite of um, descriptive attributes associated with all the reaches. Um, and so you, know, you can do all kinds of queries um, to, to pull out a consistent set of streams based on different characteristics if you're interested in, in doing that. And you can do it consistently anywhere across the country, right? Uh, and then, of course, there, there's um, lots of climate scenarios that are out there. Those are all stored online. You can access those, bring those in. Um, you know, then there's inexpensive sensors that increasingly are being deployed to um, get more precise local information. And of course, then you know, none of this would be possible without 
um, cheap and, and really powerful um, computing capacity and a GIS geospatial technologies that can kind of stitch all this stuff together. So, so that's one thing you know that that's been advancing by leaps and bounds the last um, five or so years. The other key ingredient um, is, is just the spatial statistical models that that um, uh, Jay and Aaron have been developing over the last decade or so. Um, and and for folks that have that maybe have just a more general statistical home background, these, these would be analogous to the sorts of uh, geostatistical models um, that, that have long been around for, for terrestrial um, environments. In, in this particular case, they, they've just adapted those techniques and, and, and uh, developed new covariant structures that work the way that stream networks do. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the kind of the seminal paper here was the 2006 paper, um, spatial statistical models that use flow and stream distance where and they just demonstrated kind of proof of concept and went through some of the some of the mathematical derivation of these models. But since then that they've been you know developing additional details about these to to really um, expand their their capacity to deal with data sets on stream networks. And so you know there's a lot of complex math involved in that and I don't necessarily understand all of it as a practitioner but I view these things basically as um, dot connectors, right? And so, so we go out and we, we collect samples of um, water chemistry or um, fish abundance or something that are basically just samples um, taken at a discrete location in space that are um, samples of a much broader spatial pattern, right? And so what these models do then is give us a valid means of interpolating on-stream networks information between those points on the network where we're collecting um, those samples. And so um, these models can account for, in fact, they, they enjoy having a certain amount of uh, autocorrelation within the data set um, because that allows them to have better predictive accuracy. And, and, and the really the powerful thing then um, that they let you do is that they allow you to aggregate data sets from different sources, right? So, so it used to be that spatial autocorrelation was a bad thing. You didn't want to have point sampled too closely in space because you'd start to have redundant information that could give you biased parameter estimates. Um, these models, they, they can deal with that. Um, and so um, you can start to pull together these big databases um, and extract information from the collective efforts of, of everyone across um, across a region. Um, and, and, and you know, they just basically are, are, are a better mousetrap. They'll, they'll capture, you know, kind of gradual spatial gradients within networks as you move from headwaters down to main stem rivers, but they're, they're also really good at capturing abrupt changes that sometimes occur at um, tributary confluences. And so they've got covariant structures that um, can capture both of those sorts of patterns. Um, and then as I alluded to before, they'll also a lot of times give us much improved predictive accuracy relative to some of the traditional models that, that have been out there. Um, th this is some, some work that we published a few years ago now just using a, a found data set for, for a river basin in central Idaho and, and um, the graphs just show a comparison of the predicted versus the observed summer stream temperatures using the non-spatial models in the upper right and then using that same data set with the spatial models in, in the uh, lower right. And, and a lot of times for, for temperatures at least we can account for say more than 90 percent of the variation in these big found databases and have pretty good accuracy in terms of our average prediction error. And so, you know, th this is something that I suspect would see similar performance gains for other water quality attributes, whether it be nitrates or alkalinity or, or what have you. Um, and, and there's some evidence, although we haven't used it extensively yet, for building species distribution models, that they may also um, provide provide some additional um, performance gains there as well. Um, and then one of the things you'll you'll notice too is that. Uh, um, parameter estimates, if you look at those, you know, we've got the same set of predictors in both of those models. Um, if you look at those for elevation in the spatial model and non-spatial model, you get different answers. And that's um, testament to the fact that in this particular instance, we had enough data in this data set that there was uh, spatial autocorrelation. So we got biased answers and, and estimates when we used the non-spatial model. But we get a more accurate um, estimate of, of those effects when, when we use the spatial model and we ac properly account for that autocorrelation that's in the database. Um, and then and lastly, one of the things that the models do that, that really is a nice feature is that they can describe um, the distance along stream networks over which measurements of that attribute that we're interested in um, having information on, um, those measurements are redundant, right? So, so as you um, are closer in space and you take two measurements, you know, they're, they're much more likely to be similar than if you're far apart in space. And these models can um, allow us to describe those distances over which that redundancy occurs. And so we can think about using them then for designing
efficient and, and optimized um, monitoring designs of different attributes on stream networks. And the first, then, um, they're generalizable. So, so the application that we'll talk about and highlight today is the Norwest um, stream temperature work. But you know, these are a generalizable class of models, and they're not stream temperature models. So um, you, you can use them for all sorts of things, whether it's um, the distribution and abundance of species, other water quality parameters, genetic attributes, and model different sorts of response metrics, um, whether it's Gaussian, Poisson, or um, binomial. And so, so we've got a tool now that, that gives us the capacity to um, go beyond kind of our traditional view of streams, what, where and I think a lot of times we, we've kind of viewed these things as, as peepholes or through peepholes, wherein you know we go out and we collect a few samples of that thing that we're interested in, and, and we use that to make inference about, about that much broader um, network, um, and, and now we can kind of go beyond that, where we can start to stitch together the information that, that we're obtaining at those discrete sites, but we can then, um, you know, interpolate between that and, and start to create really um, maps that show um, the characteristics of these things over that full full network, and that then, of course, allows us basically to connect the dots. And so we can start to think then about making um, smart maps, wherein, you know, we, we can show um, or create digital data that shows the status of a particular resource, um, and, and it's more than just a GIS map, which is easy to create in this day and age. You know, a person can dial that stuff up and, and create things and, and start to throw it out there, and you know, it looks like science, but um, in, in this particular instance now, we can make those maps, but have them be informed by massive amounts of underlying information, right? And so just having, you know, those basic maps a lot of times can go a long ways towards reducing uncertainty because we get a continuous representation of the world, right? And I think you know, one of the things that, that we really need to focus on and try to do is to make um, you know, this generation's maps analogous to the ones that Lewis and Clark say we're trying to make 200 years ago that just give us a continuous representation of the things that we care about and are trying to um, um, conserve and manage on, on aquatic systems. That's something that you know, to this day we're still oftentimes lacking. And then the third ingredient that, that kind of makes this, this, this concept of a stream internet possible is just the, the amount of data that's getting to be out there now, um, right? So, so whether it's different water quality attributes, nitrates, alkalinity, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there's, there's hundreds and thousands of samples of these things now that have been collected and are archived in, in various places with, with different agencies. Um, you know, distribution, abundance of different species, there, there's literally tens of thousands of surveys done for, for um, you know, fish and, and macroinvertebrates and, and other things now. They're all um, warehoused in, in databases in various places. And then there's a mountain of genetic information that's coming, right? So, so some of the work that Mike Young and, and uh, Mike Schwartz and, and others have been doing across the region where you just go out, you do biodiversity surveys, right? And you get um, fin clips from, from all the critters that, that you net from, from say, electrofishing survey, and you, you preserve those on, on um, you know, some various means. You know, there, there's literally gigabytes of data stored within each of those tissue samples um, with regards to the genetic um, and evolutionary history of that particular organism. And all that information then can be georeferenced and tied back to specific places on stream networks. And so there's just going to be a mountain of information um, on top of um, the mountains that, that we already have. And so next to kind of demonstrate, say, a macro scale application of how um, you know, this might all come together with, with regards to stream temperature and, and climate vulnerability assessments for, for the region. And I just kind of want to step through, um, you know, the process of aggregating these big databases, applying the spatial models to those, creating um, the maps that show the status of that um, particular resource temperature and in this case, and then, you know, how that can drive a whole suite of, of related applications that start to work with and synergize off of this information. And so, so this is the Norwest project. Um, that we've been working on for a couple years now. It's funded primarily by the, by the Great Northern Landscape Conservation Cooperative, although we've also um, obtained some funding from Region 1, the Forest Service, and then also um, Jason Dunham um, and through collaborations um, that he's leading in terms of doing a regional bull trout vulnerability assessment has also um, passed on to us some way to make sure that we get him a consistent set of um, temperature scenarios for, for all the places across the region that he's, he's trying to create patches and do other things for, for bull trout. Um, about five different agencies involved here, 14 or so people on, on our temperature team. And so 
this map just displays, I guess, our, our Google server or, or, you know, if you will, you know, our storage of information as a collective resource across, you know, dozens of different agencies in the Northwest and across the last couple of decades. You know, this Norwest database has basically took us about a year to pull together, but it basically represents the collective efforts of the aquatic community um, in this part of the world. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a found, quote unquote, found database in terms of, you know, it didn't exist until it had been aggregated from hundreds of different um, sources. But now that it's pulled together, you know, it's, a, it's going to be a resource that everyone can tap into if you were to go out and collect that much data by itself. It would cost you almost $10 million in terms of the equipment and hiring people and sending them out and, and um, collating all that information. Um, but now, you know, just, just through a little bit of seed money to, to hire some um, database technicians and have those folks spend time aggregating this information, we're, we're going to have that at our fingertips. Um, there's more than 45 million hourly temperature, stream temperature recordings within that database and more than 15,000 unique stream sites um, represented across um, the region. And, and the basic idea then is to use that Norwest temperature database in conjunction with um, you know, these spatial statistical network models that, that allow us to make an accurate um, um, status map showing what that particular attribute is at a point in time. And then to create geospatial data from that, put it on a website so that we then get these cross-jurisdictional maps that show different um, temperature scenarios across the region. And that then can serve as kind of a, a point of departure or, or a um, thing that can be used for strategic assessments to do apples to apples comparison across um, any part within um, the, this broad area. And so just one example then within the Clearwater River Basin, this is, this is one of the places that, that we've um, completed um, developing the models and creating um, a set of stream temperature scenarios. Um, that there's so much data, obviously, in that, that Norwest database that, that we can't crunch all of it at, at one time in one model, at least not at this point. And so what we've been doing is, is kind of chunking it up as, as we go along um, and trying to, you know, basically bite off as big a chunk as we can so that we, we minimize the number of times we have to go through this. But um, this is kind of the scale at which it would which we've been working is, is, is these uh, river basins. I think this is this is roughly a third code huck. And so this is um, the Clearwater Basin in North Idaho. Um, if we go into um, the Northwest database after the information has been cleaned and, and, and put there, um, we can extract information or extract the temperature data from that. In this particular instance, there were um, 4,487. Um, summers of monitoring effort within the Clearwater, uh, almost 746 unique stream sites were represented across this uh, river network, which, which um, consists of about 16,700 stream kilometers. So a lot of temperature data in this part of the world, and, and that's the, the foundation then that we're building um, these models off of. And this then is just an example of, of the final um, spatial statistical stream temperature model for the Clearwater that, that's built with that data set. Um, and and um, in this particular instance, we can explain about 95% of the variability in uh, mean August temperatures and do so with an average prediction error of about 0.6 degrees Celsius. Um, the predictors, the covariate predictors, they're on the left side of the model then that, that we're using um, to link to those um, temperature measurements. Those predictors are all derived from previously published nationally available geospatial layers, and so we're, we're pulling things off of um, digital elevation models, off of the NHD plus hydrography layer, um, the National Land Use Land Cover database. And so, you know, everywhere we go within the region, then it, we can quickly um, derive and summarize the same set of predictor variables. And, and potentially, if we then want to expand this to other parts of the country, we can expand beyond the north um, west U.S. And, and again, have all these at our fingertips. So we don't have to go through that part of, of creating those. We basically just have to organize the temperature data and link that to the same consistent set of covariates. Um, and then this slide looks the same as the last one, but but notice here in, in that map in the bottom right now, we, we flipped down to the Salmon River Basin. So this is another place that, that we've completed. Same set of covariate predictors and the model um, you know, is, is explaining about 90% of the variation in this particular instance. Not quite as good as Clearwater, but still pretty good. And then this third slide um, shows the other production unit that, that we've completed for what we're calling the Spakut unit, which is the um, panhandle of North Idaho and in Northwest Montana. Um, you know, similar size temperature database, more than 5,000 summers of monitoring effort, 
couple thousand unique sites in a much larger area, though, in that particular instance, geographically speaking. So, so once we've we've fit the models in and we we've calibrated it to the the temperature observations within that particular um, network, that gives us a tool then to to create a whole suite of different climate scenarios, and, and we're generating a, a lot of those. I won't go through um, all of those today, but um, basically, one, once the model is calibrated. Um, such that it's linking the stream temperature information to that set of covariates. We can create those scenarios by adjusting the air temperature, the discharge, or the percent canopy variables that are associated or, or parameterized within the model, and we can um, you know, do that to make future projections, or we can do it to make um, historical reconstructions of, of years that we've already observed. And so that's what we're showing here, say, for the, for the clear water. Um, we're, we're just going to go through a quick animation of, of reconstructing um, stream temperature scenarios for the entire river network starting in 1993, which is kind of the first year um, that most of our scenarios exist because that's the first year that people started putting out these small digital temperature sensors, and so we started seeing you know, dozens and hundreds of observations of temperatures. So um, in this particular instance, then, that, that map on the left shows what the mean August summer temperatures were um, during 1993. The graphic in the upper right shows the predicted versus the observed for um, the sensor observations for that particular year. And as we flip through each of these individual years and this time series, then you'll see that bounce around a little bit, but uh, the model does a pretty good job of, of accurately predicting across a range of different um, uh, temperature and, and discharge conditions that we've observed in this 19-year um, time series. And then the bottom right map or, or a graphic there, that just shows what the air temperature values were and the discharge values were um, that, that fed into the model to create the different scenarios. And so um, I'll just flip through a few of these. Um, I'll flip between 1993 and 1994 originally just to give you a sense of, you know, difference obviously in a, in a, between a really cold summer and a really warm summer. And you can kind of see how the air temperature values change and how the predictive performance of the model changes. And then we'll just start clicking forward. Here's 1995, 96, 97, 98, 99. And so you see that the model is doing well across that range of conditions, and so um, now we've got a tool basically can, we can reconstruct what the historical sequence of um, climates have been across this full river network, and that then serves as a, as a useful point of departure for thinking about doing future climate scenarios, right? So um, if, if we're going to talk about climate change and how things are going to um, potentially differ this, this century, we've got to compare that to some historical baseline. And so the sequence of slides we just went through, that basically gives us that historical baseline for this river basin. And then you know, different ways you can do future scenarios, but you know, one of the simplest is, is simply to add on one or two degrees Celsius onto that historical baseline and, and recalculate what your map looks like. And so here we're just flipping through that historical baseline versus a one degree Celsius increase and a two degree Celsius increase um, and, and that's kind of the, the quick and dirty way of doing a future scenario, but we're also going to explore some, some alternative means of doing that. And we can also link this specifically to IPCC scenarios and, and, and do a variety of things that might account for differential um, stream sensitivity as well. But, but it's not necessarily um, that complex a process once, once you get that historical baseline uh, and an accurate stream temperature model built. So this map then just shows another historical scenario for the Spakut unit. And so this would be the thermal scape across um, that, that particular part of the world, which is the Idaho Panhandle in northwest Montana, um, about 55,000 um, stream kilometers in this particular instance that, that we're creating um, temperature predictions for. We've got the model set to make predictions at, at a one kilometer resolution. And just by looking at that, you get a pretty good quick sense of, of where the big rivers are because those a lot of times are, well, they're always going to be the lowest elevation systems and so they're they're kind of the warmest um, systems in any particular landscape. And then um, you know where, where the really cold streams are, not surprisingly, you know, correlates well with where the Bob Marshall is and some of the higher elevation um, streams across the region. But, you know, that basically gives you a, a snapshot in time, allows you to look apples to apples across that entire region of, of where different thermal characteristics are going to exist and, and hence you know, where different species might, might prefer or, or have better and um, larger amounts of suitable habitat. And so you know, again, keep in mind that this is, this is not just a, a pretty picture or a map that we're making here. 
but it's actually a, a geospatial database, right? And so the entire coverage is basically an ArcMap shapefile that, that um, we're distributing through the NorWest website, and I'll, I'll show a link to that here at the end of the talk, but um, you, know, you can download this um, GIS map, put it in an ArcMap project, and, and then pull up the table that's associated with that, and you can run all sorts of queries then, right? The, the covariates are there um, associated with all the temperature predictions, and so it gives you a powerful tool then you know, to start asking questions about the thermal patterns within that particular landscape. Um, and it also then gives us, you know, a consistent data network. Again, if we want to think about a stream internet that allows us to run um, apps on. So, so you know, if we've got a consistent way of digitally representing the world now, we can start to plug some things onto um, that foundational data set and do some interesting value-added sorts sorts of analyses. And so that's kind of what I wanted to click through next was just you know, some of the ways that we're thinking about potentially using um, that information. So. So this is what I call our first app, or um, you know, just quantifying you know, the amount of thermal degradation that, that might exist in streams. And, and what we can do here is basically, you know, if we can consistently represent thermal patterns everywhere, then um, we can go in, we can find you know, some streams that maybe aren't as degraded, maybe they're in wilderness settings, um, or, or people that are working in, in local um, landscapes, you know, they have a a good sense of which streams are kind of healthy and functioning at capacity. Those can serve as more or less our control streams. We can then identify or pick out some streams that, that are maybe degraded that we want to get a better understanding of, you know, what's their intrinsic thermal capacity, you know, what, what could we restore that back to if we invest time and resources there. So, so we can make a kind of a treatment control comparison now because um, we've got a representation of, a consistent representation of temperature across the entire network. So you pick your streams, and then the spatial models allow you to do something that's called block creaging, which is basically just a statistical technique for um, deriving a valid estimate of the mean and the variance that's associated with um, that particular attribute that you're interested in. In this particular case, we're looking at stream temperatures. And so um, here, the graphic is just highlighting a segment of stream for which um, you know, the, the model has been um, used to make predictions that the black points are places where we've got thermograph observations along that, and then the colored points uh, are, are dense enough that it kind of all blends together as one line, but you can see a gradation there from the right to the left in terms of um, warm streams down lower and then cooler streams up higher. And that's the interpolation then that the model allows us to do between those um, temperature predictions, which are the black dots. And notice then, too, as you move along that, that stream network, the error bars, which is the width of the gray buffer along the stream, that that varies in width. And it tends to be a lot narrower when you're right near the black dots, where you've got some empirical support from the model. And it gets to be wider the further away you get from those black dots. And that stands to reason, right? So if you're in a place where you've got direct temperature measurements, you should be more confident about what temperatures are. And if you're a far, long ways away from where that um, those direct measurements exist, and you should be less confident. And the model knows that and understands the spatial relationship between the observations of that attribute on the network, and it allows you then to represent that spatial variability in terms of the precision of those estimates. And so when you're doing a block creaging estimate, then you're basically you know, just drawing a box around that part of the stream that you want to estimate a mean and variance for, and then you're getting you know, an estimate of that from the spatial techniques and, and what um, they allow you to do then is, is once we've now fit the model everywhere for, for all the streams across the region, you can basically pick and choose any stream that you want to to get these estimates fairly quickly. And you'll notice then that you know, the estimates, a lot of times, they're, they're much more precise than would be an estimate from a traditional non-spatial estimator. And um, in theory, at least, that they're going to be less biased. And so the mean and the variance on the left there would be the estimate derived from just taking the average of the stream temperatures at the black dots across that stream, and then the block creaging estimate then you know is very different. You're you're about three times more precise, and and you're unbiased. And so what you can do then um, is basically you know, do a block creage estimate for your treatment stream, uh, which in this case is a degraded stream. Do a block creage estimate for your control stream, maybe a wilderness stream that's functioning at capacity. And then you know do an apples to apples comparison between the temperature characteristics at both of those, and get some estimate of, of how much potentially you might be able to cool that degraded stream if you were to go in and, and do 
um, habitat restoration there. And so, you know, the idea is that, that by having this um, digital map and, and set of um, uh, statistical techniques that, that go along with it, you can make these apples to apples comparisons anywhere where um, the, these scenarios are, are created. Um, a related application that, that's a little bit different from stream temperatures, but it's the same basic concept that we could think about applying for um, fish living in stream networks is, is to do a block creed estimate of um, fish densities across a much larger area, right? So one of the questions that a lot of times we're interested in is how many fish live in a stream, right? If we're going to think about, you know, minimum population size or, or meeting some other um, uh, management criteria. And what we've done traditionally is we go out and we select a stream reach, we do a closed population um, removal estimate or a mark recapture, and we get a population estimate for that reach of stream. But typically that exists, you know, at, at the scale of tens to hundreds of kilometers when what we're really interested in is, is having, you know, a broader estimate of, um, you know, the population across a stream network or a river network. And the Brock Kreeging then basically allows us to aggregate information from many of those um, local closed population density estimates to a much larger spatial scale. So we can start to think then about, you know, how many fish live in this river network or stream network, you know, just, just another potentially powerful application that we could explore um, using these spatial st statistical techniques. And, and, you know, the theory for doing that has long existed within um, terrestrial systems. Um, Jay and, and other statisticians have, have published extensively on these block creeging approaches, and, and now, you know, we've basically got the analytical infrastructure that will enable us to do all this same sort of thing on um, stream networks. Um, third application that, that um, where we're actually um, more, than, more than just thinking about, we're actually um, doing this as kind of the second part of the Norwest um, project is to develop uh, a set of regionally consistent thermal niche definitions. And in this particular instance, then all we're doing is we're using those um, historical um, scenario maps derived from Norwest. We're combining those then with a big regional um, fish survey database. And this is, this is some work then that uh, Seth Wenger is leading on. And basically we're just dropping those fish surveys down on top of our temperature map to give us um, a means of estimating, you know, in a consistent manner based on tens of thousands of observations, you know, what is the thermal niche for these different species? Where, what's the temperature at which it's too warm, it's too cold, and, and what, is, what is an optimal temperature? And, and you know, we've, we've done that in the past and others have done that in the past, um, but whenever we've done it um, previously, and we're doing it at broad spatial scales, we've been forced to use air temperature as a crude surrogate for the thermal conditions that uh, fish and other aquatic biotas are experiencing. So now we're hopefully gonna be able to derive um, a more refined estimate of, of those thermal niches. And also then this potentially could be a generalizable approach, right? So, um, you know, we tend to focus on trout and salmon, but there's a lot of other um, species out there, obviously, and, and some of those are, are considered sensitive now, or they'll be considered sensitive, you know, going forward as we get more information on those. And so the basic idea here is that to derive those thermal niches for other species, basically we just need to have a georeference survey database um, of where those um, critters occur in space, and that then can all be dropped on top of uh, the temperature map, and you can quickly then get estimates of, of what's too warm, what's too cold, and, and what's just right. Um, and then application four might be um, actually um, using some of that information to do um, bioclimatic vulnerability assessments. And so um, in this particular instance, um, we're, we're using the um, historical scenario in, in um, the upper left part of that slide. You know, we, we've passed it through our biological filter. And in this case, you know, what might be a suitability criteria for bull trout and we can basically then chunk up that um, temperature map into suitable versus unsuitable um, for bull trout. And in this particular instance, we're using a temperature isotherm of 11.2 degrees um, temperature to, to highlight kind of where the um, headwater natal areas are for, for spawning and rearing. And this is what under a historic scenario that, that uh, map might look like. And then we can, you know, flip through different scenarios of, of what those habitats might evolve to be if it were to warm up by one or two degrees Celsius. And so you know, we don't know yet what, what the most likely future conditions are, but we've, we've at least got a system now built and in place where we can start to interface directly with the climate modelers and translate you know, their scenarios about the future into something that's much more specific 
on a stream network and also then translate that into you know what it means in terms of uh, habitat suitability from a thermal perspective for different species. And, and one of the things that, that's really interesting um, when, when we look a little more closely at, at what this tells us about the distribution of habitats within a landscape is that there can actually be a, a lot of variability at, at a local spatial scale in terms of the rate at which habitat um, potentially is lost. And so here um, we're, we're just zooming in on a portion of, of the upper Salmon River Basin that, that's kind of near Stanley. Uh, and I've highlighted two places here, the, the white clouds, which um, have streams that are fairly steep and they're cold. And so a lot of those places right now are good bull trout habitat. Um, and they're nowhere really near um, any sort of thermal threshold in terms of losing um, habitat suitability for this species. Comparing those two streams in the East Fork of the Salmon, which is only 10 kilometers to the east of the, of the white clouds, those are already kind of thermally marginal streams for bull trout, but there are bull trout populations there. Um, but the other difference that they have relative to the white clouds is that they're um, much lower gradient streams. And so as temperatures warm up going forward, and I'll just flip here between the historic and the, um, say, a one degree um, stream temperature warming scenario. In the East Fork of the Salmon, the projections would be that we're going to lose habitat at a much faster rate than we are in the white clouds. Uh, and that's um, primarily because, you know, temperature isotherms move much farther in a portion of the landscape that has um, low gradient than in a steeper portion of, of the landscape. And so now, you know, the model captures that dynamic and we can represent those sorts of things across the stream network to think you know, a little more precisely about how and where we might want to do or prioritize habitat restoration. And so this map, we're basically just subtracting um, the future scenario map from the historic scenario map that, that we were just looking at within the upper salmon. And the blue segments highlight the places um, on this stream network that from a thermal perspective, if your bull trout are likely to be the first ones that are that are going to go away if it were to warm up by one degree Celsius, right? And so we can use this information to think a little more strategically about where we might invest our resources to try to um, restore habitat for this species. A lot of these streams are, are in wilderness areas, and so they're pretty much functioning at capacity. They're, there's pro, you know they're just naturally warm. There's not going to be a lot that we can do, but some of these other systems are potentially degraded. And so so the hope is that we're going to have information at, at a resolution and, and a level of accuracy that's good enough that we can start to tease some of that out and think you know, a little more um, precisely about um, where we're going to allocate resources. And so you know, that's kind of the, the fifth app then would be you know, to use information of this type to start thinking about doing climate smart strategic prioritization of different restoration projects. You know, the, the toolkit or, or toolbox of of things we have to do in terms of um, being able to offset some of the um, future changes that are associated with climate change, you know, that's probably not going to change. You know, for a long time we've been uh, maintaining, restoring flows, maintaining, restoring riparian habitats, trying to keep non-native invaders out of stream systems. You know, we're basically going to have the same set of tools to work with in the future, but um, the hope is is that we can use those tools in conjunction with these sorts of um, strategic um, climate vulnerability assessments to think and, and target places more precisely across landscapes to kind of focus on, on doing the work in the places where we can make um, the biggest difference. Um, another you know, piece of useful information that we'll be able to get out of, out of these scenarios is, is for um, you know, especially small headwater populations um, like bull trout or as you move down into the, into the middle and southern Rockies, um, headwater cutthroat trout populations. A lot of those are already isolated by temperatures that are too warm, and, and so there there might only be a few kilometers or, or maybe say 10 kilometers of stream that are left. You know, there, there's the potential that some of those are, are simply going to go away um, as it warms up, and there's no more thermally suitable habitat for some of, of those isolated populations. So, in those cases, we we might be able to get a better estimate of how much time is, is potentially left on the clock for for some of those populations, given um, different rates of warming, and then be able to more specifically uh, monitor in those places to see whether or not that actually occurs to get better information about how climate might cause local extirpations. Um, or, you know, further down in the system where, where we're getting uh, some of these uh, um, non-native invaders moving up through river networks, things like um, smallmouth bass and brown trout, um, the scenarios could be used to highlight 
um, portions of the river network that are, are likely to become um, susceptible to invasions you know, over the next 10 or 20 years. So we can kind of stay a step ahead of some of these um, invaders to think um, you know, more about how we might want to manage them or, or potentially control them to the extent that we have that um, ability. Um, and, and then just a little bit of a sidebar, you know, that they're just, you know, th this is something that is going to happen, you know, that there's, you know, lots of models that, that we and others have been making for, you know, decades now that predict climate change would cause fish distributions to shift. But one of the things that, that we've been, you know, really lacking is having good biological evidence to actually prove that the fish are tracking climate. Um, and I think we're going we're gonna to start to see that change in a big way, that there's um, a lot of interesting work going on now across the western U.S. to start um, testing some of that more directly. And then, you know, I just wanted to put this study out um, that, that was published a few months ago from, from France that is actually doing a really nice job of starting to demonstrate that fish are indeed um, tracking climate. And so, you know, here they just did resurveys of, of, you know, thousands of sites across the country um, 20 or 30 years after the initial surveys were done. And they're just looking at how the upper and lower extents of the distributions of different species are changing and, and they are seeing a broad systematic shift across um, you know, most of the 32 or so species that they looked at in terms of the fish moving to higher elevations to get to cooler areas. And so you know, th this is just you know, to help emphasize that this is in fact a reality, something that we're going to have to deal with. Um, and the hope is then you know, by developing something like Norwest, which is basically a crowdsourced approach to doing science, um, that, that we're going to have kind of a nice basis for, for um, thinking about and, and working in a coordinated um, interagency fashion. You know, most of the data that, that we're getting to build these models is collected by people that work in the local landscapes. And so, you know, all research is doing in this particular instance is um, providing some value added to that data, extracting useful information from the data that people have been collecting and then serving it back to them in a format, hopefully, that allows them to make, um, you know, better strategic allocation of, of their resources and, and then, you know, because it's derived from all agencies, hopefully everyone feels kind of like they have some skin in the game here and, and it can be a foundation um, to bring people together in terms of doing um, coordinated management going forward. And then to make, you know, it easy to use this information, um, the stream internet has to use the real internet, right? So so we have to have a means of, of piping this information out and so, so we've created the Norwest website and so, um, this was launched last December, and as we rotate through the region and we do different um, river basins and, and organize the, the data and, and create the scenarios for um, those river basins, then um, that gets put out on the website so that people that collected the information have um, rapid access to it, and we're basically working our way um, through the region over, over this next year. Three basic things that we're serving out, the, the GIS shape files. Um, that you can pull up an arc map of the stream temperature scenarios, number one. Number two, we're putting out um, shape files that just show the, the spatial variation in the uh, precision of the model predictions. So, you know, if you want to think about designing efficient monitoring strategies, you can use that information um, for that. And then thirdly, for the folks that give us permission to distribute um, their, their raw data, we're, we're serving out a copy of that summarized to um, the, the daily time steps. We're putting out daily maxes, mins, and means um, for, you know, anyone that wants it, and, and so far at least, Probably 95% of people that have contributed data to this big regional effort have been, you know, more than willing um, and, and quite enthusiastic about um, sharing their data. And so that's been, you know, really encouraging um, to see. And, and the hope then is that that's just having ready access to, to lots of data, that that can also help spur, you know, acceleration of, of the rate at which we're doing research about thermal regimes within streams and, and learning and building better model so that, you know, again, it can kind of accelerate this whole process. And so this is this is the blob map that we kind of use to track our, our progress as, as we rotate through the region. Um, so far the blob has swallowed uh, more than 14,000 summers of data and, and it's uh, created thermal ooze across almost 100,000 um, kilometers of stream. And, you know, by the end of this process then hopefully we'll have thermal ooze across all streams within the region. Um, th this is the, the deadline map or, or the um, schedule map that we're working with. Uh, the green areas here are places that we've completed and all that information is, is out on the Norwest website. Um, the yellow are the places that we're currently working. Um, we're close to being done with the headwaters of Missouri and then we'll get um, southern Idaho done this summer and then we'll get the interior 
uh, or, or uh, eastern Oregon and Washington done um, by the end of the year. So hopefully we'll have the whole interior Columbia River Basin done by the end of this calendar year. Um, and then there's a whole suite of additional things that, that I didn't talk about, but that um, might be really interesting to, to um, have some of these folks on in the future and talk about how this information then starts to feed into and enable um, some of the work that they're doing. I mentioned before the, the regional bull trout climate vulnerability assessment that Jason Dunham is leading. Basically, we're working hand in hand with him, and as we create a climate scenario, we pass it on to his group, and, and they've got you know computer algorithms set up to run that that um, take and and um, patch up those thermal characteristics into um, chunks of habitat that are thermally suitable for bull trout, and then they have a whole suite of additional things that they're driving um, with regards to describing. Uh, other characteristics of those um, thermally suitable patches that um, are all going to feed into their climate vulnerability assessment. Um, Doug Peterson was the lead in, on that second bullet there of developing some decision support tools for cutthroat trout and bull trout that again work directly off of some of these climate scenarios that, that we've been developing. So you know, we've got um, modules out there then that, that can start to um, integrate this information and do so consistently across any river basin within the full region as we develop um, you know, the final set of climate scenarios everywhere. Um, bull trout monitoring protocol that we developed a few years works hand in hand with this. Um, the thermal niches that, that we talked about. And then, you know, obviously, once you go through and you organize the data set across, you know, everyone that's been collecting it the last 20 or so years and you put that information out there uh, so people can kind of see where in space it exists, you know, it almost starts to, um, you know, form itself in terms of making more efficient um, monitoring designs going forward because people, the tendency is going to be that they're not going to collect additional data where there already is a lot of data exists. They're probably going to move to collect it on um, streams that um, we don't know as much about. And so over time, that can be kind of a self-organizing um, sort of thing. And so these are all, again, just apps that, that kind of run on a consistent data network. If, if you think about smartphones being a way to access um, interesting doodads that you can um, run uh, on the internet. We can do that now basically for streams. Um, another fun thing that, that we're experimenting with is just trying to uh, make all this information readily available. There's actually, um, to, to anyone that has, has a smartphone, there's actually an ArcGIS app now that you can download, put it on your phone, and, and then you can, um, as these scenarios are created, those can go out on, on the ArcGIS website, and then basically anyone that um, has that app on their phone, could access the temperature scenarios, um, habitat maps, um, et cetera, et cetera, the same way you can access Google Maps off of your smartphone. So wherever you are in space, you could be um, potentially accessing this information. And, you know, we've been focused on, on trying to do this for, for temperature, obviously, but, you know, the, the infrastructure to do these sorts of analyses and, and to um, build things that are, that are more accurate and spatially consistent now, you know, as part of this NorWest project, you know, we had to do a lot of pre-processing of um, the NHD plus hydrography layer for this part of the world. Um, that's all out there and that's done, that's sitting on the web, so anyone can grab that. You can bring additional geospatial um, databases for other attributes um, that, that you're interested in, in working with um, and save yourself a few steps. Um, and then, of course, you know, Aaron and Jay's work, um, you know, they, they've got a a commitment to doing things in kind of an open source environment. So all the statistical models that they've been building, um, you know, they've been embedding their thinking and, and the code for those in um, our packages that, that are open access and freeware. And we've developed, um, you know, for them a web page to help disseminate this information, the SSN and STARS um, website. So you can um, just Google that and it'll pop up. And then there's a whole suite of um, data sets out there. Um, there's lots of um, you know, some of the publications, some of the GIS tools that they've developed, um, et cetera, et cetera. The R package that they recently published is also downloadable here. And so you know, basically all the, all the components that you'd need to be able to fit and use these sorts of spatial models with stream temperature or whatever attribute that you're interested in, all that's out there. And so people can um, go to this website, get it, and start playing around with these things if, if, if they're interested. And so just here to close, you know, this is, this is um, you know, compelling points from, from my perspective for, you know, why we need a stream internet and, and how it's possible. You know, the technology basically exists. We have spatial stream models. We've got computing horsepower, geospatial technologies, and these provide the basic routers, switchers, and servers um, that allow us to develop and transfer massive amounts of accurate information about stream resources. You know, something like this is needed. All agencies, um, 
are experiencing declining budgets and they need to do more with less. And so, you know, we've also got these mandates that, you know, say we, we've got to address these overarching cross-boundary threats like climate change or human population growth and how that might impact aquatic resources. It's obviously a scalable thing. You know, there, there's nationally available geospatial data sets like the NHD plus hydrography layer, other remote sensing attributes. Um, you know, there's huge and, and growing aquatic databases for the things that we're trying to manage and conserve. And then there's, you know, obviously a large customer base that's comprised of the natural resource stewards from dozens of different resource agencies across the country that, you know, potentially something like this would, would be useful for, for servicing their needs. And then it's wanted. Um, you, you can design, um, you know, killer apps that, that basically translate the information from, you know, the basic scenarios into a format that, that's useful for addressing specific uh, management um, issues within that particular landscape. And a lot of times, you know, it's built from the data that, that people are collecting there. And so um, it kind of creates a virtuous cycle potentially between research and management. Costs to do this, that they're, they're relatively minimal. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, our biggest investment is just in, in the salaries of having some database engineers and technicians that can aggregate this information. Um, once it's aggregated into a usable database, um, actually fitting the spatial models to it, developing the geospatial scenarios from that, putting it on a website, those don't take very long. It takes us probably three months to organize a temperature database for um, one of these river basins, and it takes us then only about two to three weeks once the database is there to create the model and do all the additional um, things to it that, that we kind of just step through. So, so it's not really expensive to do a lot of this work. And I, I would argue that, you know, the value of better information, that, it, that it's almost priceless. It, it, it's difficult to value exactly, you know, how it's going to let people do their jobs better, but, you know, they, they are um, undoubtedly going to be able to do their jobs better by having better spatial data at their fingertips. And so you know, the hope is that we can not only do more with less, but, you know, there's the potential even with shrinking budgets that we could do a lot more with less. And so that's all I've got. I've probably just about used up all my time, but I really appreciate um, folks that were willing to stick around for the whole talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Um, so let me go ahead and open it up to some questions and comments. Um, we we are kind of at, at 11 o'clock, but if folks are willing, uh, and Dan, if you're willing to take an extra 10 to 15 minutes, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. And if, if you're online, it would be probably best for me to uh, take questions via the chat function. And if you look at your screen, at the top of your screen, there's a viewing Dan's presentation desktop uh, bar. And as you mouse over that, uh, a menu comes down and there's a chat function there. Um, and if I, also you can uh, open the, uh, participant box and raise your hand and I can unmute your phones from there so so let's see uh, Dan we do have the first question um, how do you deal with data quality when combining data sets and then I'll ask a related question it seemed like you were a little data poor in the state of Washington and Wyoming right um. I'll, I'll address the latter first. Um, there's eastern Montana, eastern Wyoming, there's just not very much temperature data at all. Um, Washington, we're, we're probably not as deficient as that map makes it look like we are. Um, that map's probably a year old, and, and since then we've been receiving some additional data sets. Um, that said, we won't know for sure until we rotate through that part of the world exactly how much data we have. Um, We've been trying to um, work through the, the North Pacific LCC to, to um, you know, secure funds that, that um, you know, give us the, the um, capacity to make sure we do another data push for that part of the world and that we can build the scenarios there. And it's my understanding that maybe some of the uh, coastal tribes have a lot of uh, stream temperature data, um, and I'm, I'm not sure yet how well represented that is in, in the Norwest database, but we've certainly been interacting with those folks and trying to get a better sense of that. Um, with regards to data quality, um, yeah, as you can imagine, um, with the that sort of big found temperature database, you, you kind of get it in all way, shapes, or forms, and so we've had to you know, put various screens on the process to make sure that, um, you know, poor data wasn't feeding through um, the models that we're building. 
you know, and one of the first screens that we, that we did at the, at the outset of the project was to say that, you know, we're only going to take digital data. So, so uh, we basically want um, things that have come off of thermographs rather than the old, say, Ryan temp mentors, the, the paper scrolls. We're, we're not going to go back in time and try to transcribe and, and save that information. So, so um, we're getting things just off of digital sensors, and, and we had a minimum number of requirements in terms of measurements per day um, that we'd accept. Um, you know, kind of a, as, as just the process baseline, and then you know, as it feeds through the process of, of organizing that information into a usable database and, and fitting the models to it, then you know, other flags will pop up in terms of you know, identifying outliers. Um, and in some cases, if you don't have a good georeference coordinate, you can't put it back on, on the right stream, and so some of that information doesn't make it through to the final models. Um, but that's one of the luxuries of dealing with these big databases is when you get some obvious um, um, screwy data in there, you, you don't worry too much about trying to hang on to it. You just kind of set it aside and, and you move on, and, and, and we're still ending up with so much data at the end of the process and, and putting um, you know, rigorous screens on it that we're still having a lot of empirical information um, to which we can fit the models. Um, you know, that said, you know, there, there still are differences among the sensors in terms of you know, how precise they are, how accurate they are, um, and then that's certainly something that we were kind of concerned with at, at the outset of this, is, you know, how much instrumental variability would there be and, and would that really cost us? But you know, we, we've been working with these sorts of found databases now that come off of all sorts of temperature sensors and people are using different protocols to put these things in and, and there's there's so much signal relative to that um, sort of noise in, in these data sets that it just doesn't seem to be much of, of an issue, at least at the stream scale, river network scale. You know, we, we wouldn't be able to explain 90 or 93 percent of the variation in stream temperatures if there was a lot of just random noise there to um, kind of pollute the signal. and so. Um, some of the data quality issue goes away by simply screening. Other parts of it, you know, it's probably still there as measurement error, but that's the part of the 7 to 10 percent of the overall variability that um, we can't address. Um, temperature is probably the best case scenario in terms of dealing with these large aggregated databases. You know, fish density, um, distributional data can have some additional issues, but so far, for temperature at least, um, we haven't found it to be a, a big hindrance to what we're trying to do. Great. Uh, I, I see that Steve Klein has a question, and Steve, unfortunately, uh, if you could go to the chat function and tell me what your call-in user number is, I can open up that line. Are there any other questions on chat? Not seeing any. Well, why don't I go ahead and up, I'll, I'll go ahead and up, open up all the all the lines so that. Folks can just speak up if they have a question. It'll take a minute. Actually, let's see. Does anyone have a question for Dan? Steve, are you? Uh, we're not. I guess we're not hearing. I'm, I seem to be having a problem with the unmute function. So apologize. So if you do have a question, folks, if you could use the chat function, I can uh, relay that to uh, to Dan. Okay, here's one. Um, Dan, will you be holding any field work trainings uh, on this at all, and uh, specifically in Eastern Washington? There's a question there. Um, well, so so as part of the Western Division American Fisheries Society meeting that was in Boise in, in mid-April, we actually 
flew Aaron over from Australia and had Jay down from Alaska, and we put on a one-day um, workshop to train people in using the spatial statistical models and using the new um, freeware R package and whatnot. And so um, that, that was kind of our best, most recent opportunity for training, at least in that regard. Um, and we're, we're, there, there was a lot of interest in it. We actually did that as a national webinar, too. And so um, the thinking is we may start to do that on an annual basis. Um, we'll, we'll think more about it this winter and, and see if um, we don't try to host that again in Boise or some part of the country to provide you know, more information on, on using those models. And the hope is that um, you know, over time we can kind of build a, a user community that um, you know, works with those models because there are so many potential applications. Um, I don't know if, if that's necessarily what the um, question was about or whether they were um, more interested in, in training for temperature monitoring or, or, or whatnot. Um, but you know, we've, we've got protocols that we've developed there and, and many others have developed protocols for collecting stream temperature information that um, could be made available and, and you know, that's... Yeah, how about yours? Yeah? yeah and actually, oh, they're, they're, they're... I have been able to unmute the line, so... <laughs> So folks, you you are live. Steve, did you did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, I did have one. Uh, Dan, you know this whole notion about you know now that we have a a base, a place to come off of applications to do uh, a risk assessment. You know, as we move through time, our understanding of let's say thermal niches. Uh, you know, this notion of lethality. Um, in other words, being able to not only track exposure through time but effects, do you have any sense of how that, you know, that we might move through time and uh, and be able to revisit these decisions rather than creating this, you know, all or nothing uh, decision environment? Right, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it it's going to be interesting to actually get a better handle on how this plays out because the, the you know, the temperature trends are so gradual. I mean, we're talking about one or two tenths of a degree over, over a decade, right, in terms of it being being warmer. And so how exactly does that play out? What does that biological signature look like in terms of, of the fish or other um, critters doing something different? Um, you know, the theory is that their distributions are going to have to shift, um, you know, gradually through time and or their phenology is going to have to shift, um, and the hope is that, that we'll have accurate enough stream temperature information now that we can represent that and get a better estimate of the rates at which that should be occurring. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of, of that building that next piece and understanding and documenting the rates of change in, in the biota, right? So uh, Lisa Crozier and others have done some nice work with the phenology stuff. But, um, you know, we still need, especially on the spatial distribution shift, the, the way they've, say, documented it in France, you know, is that happening? If so, what's the rate at which it's happening? And how do we tie that then to the rate of change in the thermal environment? So all this stuff is, is linked together. Um, you know, and I, I think there's still years of research to do in that regard, but hopefully this can be a foundation for doing that and starting to step through the process in, in a more precise and rigorous way. Yeah, because I'm facing that issue right now of engaging risk managers in decision making and what does this all mean and what am I supposed to do about it? And, you know, this all-or-nothing environment, being able to um, make decisions in real time and move with the problem, that there's a, there's a lot of work to be done there. Right. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, like you said, all, all or nothing, right? So we can build maps that show, okay, here's what it is now. Here's what it would be 50 years from now, contrasting those, and there's a big difference. But, you know, to get from point A to point B, it's, it's a gradual, slow process, right? And so if, if you're having to make, calls on, on management actions based on that slow, gradual process, that, that gets to be really difficult. And so I think one, one of the first things that we should be doing is, is using this information to maybe highlight places on landscapes that um, are going to be more sensitive to change, and that might be then where we kind of target some monitoring efforts, whether for stream temperature or for biological responses, to really document and prove to ourselves over time that these um, sorts of dramatic changes we show happening over 50 years and 100 years that those are actually happening to kind of, again, build that foundation for uh, allowing people to make that leap to making some of, you know, what are really going to be hard decisions in some cases. Thanks. 
Hey, Dan, there's a question from Alaska, and, and as you probably are aware, you know, the, a lot of the data sets and data are, are coarser scale up in Alaska. So the question is, you know, what are some of the relative sensitivities of predictive factors that you're picking up on some of your covariates that you think might apply up in Alaska? You know, elevation, canopy, right. discharge. Yep. Yeah, and that, actually, I had a slide for that in here um, that, that I took out because I don't want to spend <clears throat> as much time talking about the details of the temperature work. But, but that's something that we're, we're um, trying to learn, and we're already seeing some interesting differences among the river basins in terms of, of um, the things that appear to be explaining most of the variability. Um, elevation is one that always comes out as being a big driver. Um, Lakes sometimes can be a big driver depending on, you know, how many lakes there are within that particular um, landscape. In, in northwest Montana where things have been glaciated, um, you know, lakes are a big driver in terms of, of a lot of times creating warmer streams. But in other portions of, of the region like the Clearwater, there aren't very many lakes or they are just tiny headwater lakes that don't have a big impact on the thermal signature downstream. And so, you know, that in that particular case, we don't see it being that important. Um, gradient pops out as one that, that oftentimes has a cooling effect, so steeper streams tend to be a little bit cooler once you account for everything else. Um, discharge, interannual variability in discharge has an effect on temperatures, although it's not as big as, as um, you know, some of the other effects, um, but in, in general, the, the higher the discharge year is, the, the cooler um, streams are going to be. Um, and, and yeah, there, there's several other things in our models, too, that, that kind of give us a relative sense of, of what's going on. I'd be happy to share more of that information with, with uh, the person up there in Alaska if, if they send me a direct email. Canopy is obviously an, an important one that, that we're seeing, especially on, on smaller streams where, where you know canopy density has a big effect on um, the amount of shade and solar radiation that reaches the stream um, that we see over and over again. But on larger streams, then obviously becomes becomes less important. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to figure that out as we go along. We've got a, a, you know, some estimates now of, of which are most important and how that varies across space that, that um, I'd be glad to share and, and give better descriptions of, of the covariates that we're using, too, with that folk person up in Alaska. Okay, yeah. Dan, I'll go ahead and send your email address out to the group here. And um, thanks. Lynn, uh, you had a question, and, and uh, I'm wondering if you want to ask that over the phone because I was a little confused about which existing stressors you, you wanted to talk about. Lynn, are you on the line? Lynn had a question about how easy it is to overlay the Northwest data with data on existing stressors. I, I wasn't sure exactly what other types of existing stressors she might be referring to. Right. I guess it just depends on the format that that other information is represented in. The um, temperature scenarios that, that we're putting out, those are all ArcMap shape files that a person could just pull into um, any, any ArcGIS project and, you know, then you click them on and they'll display what the temperature prediction is under different scenarios at, at that site. Um, and if, if the other information on stressors can be represented in a geospatial environment like that, then you could pretty quickly start to bring these things together. Great. Well, Dan, it's, it's getting uh, close to 1120, and I think we probably should go ahead and wrap it up with that, that last question there. And I just want to thank you again, and, and uh, thank you for your time today and a great presentation. That was a lot of material to present, so congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. And I did send your email around to everyone, so I hope this uh, you know, kind of create a continuing dialogue on this, this, this whole topic. Great. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity, David, and, and it will be a continuing discussion. Still lots of work to do.